from the television studios of the Jack J. Valente School of Communication at the University of Houston. This is the discovery section of Graffiti, the electronic newsletter of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. My name is John David Powell. Lorraine Stock is an associate professor of English at, and the recipient of the University of Houston's 2008 Teaching Excellence Award for Innovation in Instructional Technology based on her use of modern media to teach medieval literature. And here's a bit of irony. Stock wasn't always a techie. While developing her film and literature course, she began editing film clips to show in class. Now, she designs customized web pages incorporating audio, video, and text. She received her bachelor's degree from City University of New York and her master's and doctoral degrees from Cornell University. And just recently, she attended a conference, and I think we'll talk about that right off the bat, because you, single-handedly, <laughs> with no, a colleague. double-handedly, double with a colleague. Have changed the face of Daniel Defoe research for the last 50 years. Anything you learned in school, you can just throw out because of you. Well, that's what somebody said. I, I hope that he was right. Uh, my <laughs> my uh, collaborator and I, Betty Proctor, we have been working on an argument that uh, Defoe's novel Mal Flanders is based on the character of Chaucer's Wife of Bath. And I felt pretty certain of that, and, and Betty wasn't so sure because she doesn't know the medieval part, but I did, and she did the 18th century part, and we put together our argument, and we felt that we had a, a really pretty good uh, assemblage of uh, compelling parallels, et cetera, and evidence, but we don't have any actual proof. And uh, the 18th century people at the conference uh, endorsed our paper and said that one of them told us both independently that we had changed the face of Defoe studies from the last 50 years because Defoe apparently, the, the conventional wisdom is that Defoe didn't uh, use a lot of literary allusion to previous authors, to the great poets, and um, if he used Chaucer then uh, that sort of flies in the face of everything we always thought about Defoe. And so I hope we're right, um, but but I'm going to go along with what he said and, and believe it. Okay, literary illusions. Is it, mm -hmm. That's like paying an homage to someone or yes, copying or, the style or, or just or, lifting from or the work. Sometimes, I mean, Chaucer himself uh, never really made up a story. He was always doing uh, translations of Boccaccio or another French writer or Dante or another author from the Middle Ages or from uh, even classical times. And so, you know, it wasn't considered plagiarism, it was considered an, homo an homage. Mm -hmm. And uh, later authors all, uh, you know, Dryden talked about, Dante, uh, about Chaucer being the father of English poetry, and people like Pope in the 18th century and Dryden both did translations of Chaucer's Wife of Bath's Tale and the prologue of the Wife of Bath to her tale. Mm -hmm. So those are literary homages and translations too. It's just that nobody thought that Dryden had ever done this. And, and Dryden doesn't explicitly say, I'm channeling Chaucer here, but uh, Betty Proctor and I really think that he did. Uh, and we feel pretty convinced ourselves that uh, uh, Mal Flanders owes an awful lot of her character to the wife of Bath, so that's really great fun. So where was this conference? The conference was in Corpus Christi. It was the South uh, Central 18th Century Studies Conference, and we decided that we would try out our idea on some 18th century people. We're thinking about next presenting the idea at the New Chaucer Society, perhaps in 2010, to see how the Chaucer people feel about it. Uh, and I feel pretty confident that they'll like the idea too. Oh, sure they yeah, will. Yeah. So now, now what happens uh, to all of those who studied Defoe, and, and do, is this just something they add to their uh, well, body I, of knowledge, I think, or do they have to go uh, back? You know, it isn't just a footnote. It's a way to open up Defoe studies. Uh, you know, now if you think, well, it's possible that De if Defoe was channeling Chaucer, who else might he be, uh, ah. you know, playing with in literary illusion? illusion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it opens the door to thinking about uh, his novels in new ways, which, you know, uh, I have to be frank, when you've been working with an author like Chaucer, especially, who's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, you know, and it's hard to come up with something new to say about what he said originally, but what you do is you find ways of, uh, his, re you know, showing his relevance in later times, and so I think, you know, Chaucer, this, this uh, uh, increases Chaucer's stock a little bit, and it also, in my opinion, increases Defoe's stock, because it meant that he was reading a great poet, and I hope, I hope I'm right uh, that, uh, you know, he was channeling Chaucer.
Okay. So, Let's go back in the time a few more centuries, back to about the 12th century. Mm -hmm. uh, last March, yes. you were at a conference presenting uh, the uh, now starring the Third Crusade depictions of Richard I and Saladin in films and television series. Yes. It's kind of timely. So yes. uh, what is that about and well, how did it come uh, about? Well, Fordham U University, uh, every year their medieval studies uh, uh, group has a conference with a theme and last year's theme was the Crusades. Uh, and remembering the Crusades. And I uh, posited that I would like to do a paper, and nobody else even thought about doing this. I said, what about movies? I said, there are a lot of movies that depict the Third Crusade, and the stars of the Third Crusade then become, even in the Chronicles, it, historians tend to single out Richard the Lionhearted. Uh, he was a bigger-than-life figure, and Saladin, who was his uh, antagonist uh, among the, uh, the Muslims. And, so uh, I looked for movies that uh, depicted both of them or each one singly, and I did a paper in which I ba basically sort of talked about the history, uh, the cinematic history of Richard the Lionheart and uh, Saladin. And many of the people at the conference who were uh, mostly, quite a few of them were historians, uh, very traditional historians, uh, and they had no truck with movies. You know, they wouldn't have even thought about the movies, but they found uh, these depictions of these uh, historical characters fascinating. Uh, there's one that is a particular favorite of mine. Uh, 1935, of all people, Cecil B. DeMille did a movie called The Crusades, uh, starring Henry Wilcox and, and um, Loretta Young. Uh, and, um, you know, it's a, it's a typical Cecil B. DeMille blockbuster spectacular. It's in black and white, though. Uh, and it does some really interesting things with um, the gender construction and sexuality of Richard the Lionheart. Uh, historians are sort of equally divided about whether Richard the Lionhearted uh, was gay or not. I mean, they wouldn't have used the word gay in the 12th century, but, uh, you know, the idea that he uh, was a homosexual or was at least bisexual. And there's a lot of controversy over that. And I found that Cecil B. DeMille in his film, uh, has about a 50% uh, depiction of Richard the Lionheart as being quite suggestively gay, and the other 50% is, oh no, no, you know, not at all. So, I mean, he was kind of on the fence himself, and it was 1935. He wasn't going to completely out Richard the Lionhearted, I don't think, but and we're familiar with very the ones that we see, like Robin Hood, this one, mm -hmm. King Richard. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, there are international films or foreign films, uh, especially in, in, in Egypt, I think, El Nassar, oh, yes. Saladin. Oh, yes. Uh, Chaheen's uh, Saladin is a f yeah. fantastic movie. And, and I, I did show clips in my, in my presentation, and I talk about uh, Chaheen's movie in, in the paper that is going to be published out of this uh, uh, presentation that I did. Uh, that movie is uh, it's an astonishing movie. And it, what it does is it shows the Third Crusade from the Arab point of view. Uh, most Hollywood movies show a very Eurocentric idea of the Crusades, uh, the, the, the white, Christian, monolithic, uh, European uh, sort of mm -hmm. armies uh, at the Crusades, uh, which were relegated to just the term the Franks from the French. Uh, you know, they're all the heroes. And the other guys are the bad guys, you know, definitely always the villains. And Shaheen did a remarkable movie in which, again, uh, both of these sides are propaganda. Uh, Chaheen is doing propaganda for the other side, but it's interesting that finally there was a, uh, at least an attempt at making a balanced view of, of that war mm -hmm. and of the antagonists in the war. And so in that movie, uh, all the Franks are really terrible. They're, 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 uh, they destroy things and they, they, uh, they're vicious and they're, they're brutal and, and really almost like beasts in the way they treat the Muslims, and um, Saladin is this wise, very, uh, very, very, you know, cerebral uh, leader and, and is the hero. He's the hero of the movie. Rainstock, thank you. We're going to have to get together again. This okay. is fascinating. Yes. Well, thank you very much. I was really happy to be with you. I appreciate it. All right. And thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next time.